Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for coming to join us at another FINS event. Uh, the Forum on Integrated Naval History and Sea Power Studies was started by the History Department here at the Naval Academy. And our effort is to bring, as you can see from our wonderful new sign here, naval history and sea power and strategy all together in conversation with each other. A number of you have come to visit us when we've done our first Bell Lecture Series, which is a partnership with the Stockdale Center, uh, where we have uh, lectures or talks from folks who have done research on naval history and leadership. Uh, and today we're launching a new effort, what we're calling Sea Power Scuttlebutt, uh, which is going to be a, a more conversational uh, approach to discussions about sea power. And we're lucky enough to have with us today as our first guest, Rear Admiral James Goldrick of the Royal Australian Navy. And so I'll, I'll introduce him, read his bio for you, and then he and I will have a little bit of a, of a chat. I've got some pre-prepared questions. Uh, and then we'll open it up to the audience to, to join in in Q&A and, and join in our discussion. So Admiral Goldrick joined the Royal Australian Navy in 1974 and retired in 2012 as a two-star rear admiral. He commanded uh, two ships in the Australian Navy, the, the Sussex and the Sydney. He commanded the Sydney twice, so I guess we should count that three times, right? He was also the multinational maritime interception force commander in the Persian Gulf, commanded the Australian Defense Force Academy. He led Australia's Border Protection Command and later he commanded the Australian Defence College. As a visiting fellow at the Sea Power Centre in Australia, he's an adjunct professor at the University of New South Wales, and a professorial fellow at ANCORS, not sure what the acronym is. Australian National Centre for Ocean Resources and Security. Ah, fantastic. He is the author of a number of excellent naval histories, including recently Before Jutland, the Naval War in Northern European Waters, August of 1914 to February of 1915, and After Jutland, the Naval War in European Waters from June 1916 to November 1918. Um, so thank you very much for joining us today, Admiral. Um, I want to get started with, you know, here we are at the Naval Academy. From your bio, clearly you have a, a deep engagement with military education and naval education, having been you know, roughly the Australian version of the superintendent, as well as commanding the, their version of the War College. Um, so your first visit here as a sub-lieutenant was a little bit over 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. and I went and found the article from almost exactly 40 years ago in proceedings in April of, uh, April of 1982, Lieutenant Goldrick's article on the Naval Academy and on naval education and an Australian's perspective of it. Um, so I was wondering if you could talk with us a little bit about how education sh has shaped your personal kind of views of sea power and strategy, but also kind of more broadly how you see it fitting in a naval career. Um, I've actually had very little formal education in sea power and strategy. Um, with the way our system ran at the time, um, having spent two years at the Naval College, um, I then got sent to a university to do a degree, a bit like ROTC, and was doing a history degree. Um, so what I suppose is the important point is it's, the, it's education that matters, because teaching you to analyse, to think, to have a respect for facts, to try and look at things in different directions um, is, I think, the, the vital skills that you, that you should get in your education and that that should be the aim of education. Um, you know, my points when I was Commandant of our Defence Force Academy, uh, which was a joint organisation uh, with Navy, Army, Air Force and about a thousand midshipmen and cadets, uh, which I sometimes liken to ruling former Yugoslavia, um, if you mids think you've got different groups amongst the midshipmen try doing three services. Um, actually four, because there are people who want to be pilots. Um, but one of my messages to everybody was, I don't care actually what degree you do. What I want you to do is a degree which interests you and which causes you to actually expand your mind, that it's not about box ticking. Um, because although I have an arts degree, 
and my second degree is Master of Letters in History. What I'll tell you is the people, in my view, who are most impressive in naval history and arguably in other elements of service history are people who actually have an engineering background who then get it. <laughs> um, because that combination I find um, unstoppable. Um, but the thing about education is that to, it's got to encourage the attitude of lifelong learning. Um, I used to let the graduating class of ADFA into what I call the secret of ADFA the morning before they graduated. And what I meant by that was, was why have we kept you here for three years when you could have been out there learning your hard professional skills as a junior officer? And most of the things you do as a junior officer, you do not need a college education for. And the senior academic, the rector, never quite forgave me for the fact that he'd admitted to me once that if you give a final year engineering student a first year engineering exam, they'll fail it. So it, the degree, even an engineering degree, cannot be simply about facts. And my line was what, we were, what you were there for was to learn how to learn. And that, in my view, is what distinguishes leaders in the military from the followers. Um, ethically, bravery, morally, all other ways, you know, some of the most admirable people I've met in the military are not commissioned. But if you're going to be a commissioned officer, you need to be able to examine a pro problem and find a solution whether that problem's operational or logistic or whatever. And you're, that's actually what your leadership's about, is ensuring that you find a solution um, and that you know to examine a problem, you know to approach it properly, thoroughly examine all the aspects and drive to a solution. And my, my telling them the secret of ADFA is you are here to learn how to learn and you have got not to stop learning through your entire career and you know I've seen too many people in my own Navy who are a bit like Frederick the Great's mule which is the story I always finished off my secret of Adfa with I'm sure some of you have heard it Frederick the Great who of course was one of the greatest military geniuses of the 18th century is let's put it this way slagging off one of his generals and his minister says oh but your majesty General von Schultz is a veteran of 20 campaigns and Frederick the Great says, my mule is a veteran of 20 campaigns and is still a mule. <laughs> so that was really the, you know, that's what to me education's about. And to me, history, and it's not simply naval history or military history, it's actually in the wide and general sense, um, is an incredible tool for helping you, preparing you both to find the solution and also what is the second great leadership challenge in reality, and it's happening, I'm sure there are lots of leaders in the US military of units who are facing it now. How do you lead your people through ambiguity and uncertainty? As situations are unfolding and you're not quite sure what's gonna happen. Well, you're much, easier, you're much better at doing that if you have some understanding that that's the way it always is. And you're gonna have to comfort your people that life is not simple and that we can't be sure. Um, and again, the more you studied history, and by the way, I believe a lot of what Clausewitz to say is, has to say is actually about this. You know, it's part of his idea of the genius and the sensibility of, of a commander. Um, and I find history is a wonderful intellectual tool for that. As well, um, it's really helpful in knowing where the bodies are buried. I'll give you an instance. I was at Johns Hopkins yesterday at SAIS talking to the Strategic Thinkers Program, having a conversation with a US Navy captain, and he just made some comment about lower half and one half, um, upper half in terms of one and two stars. He had no idea of the history of the US Navy's moving from all two stars, upper and lower half, to one stars who are called Commodores, who really hated it, to one stars who are rear admirals and all the politics of that. 
um, the pressures from the other services. Um, that's a very small and trivial example, but I've certainly found in my career knowing where the, um, where the bodies are buried is incredibly useful. I also would associate the greatest regrets of my career when I didn't actually apply the prism and lens of historical analysis to an emerging problem. And you know, all of us have regrets over the Gulf War in 2003, but the thing that I regret most is not believing, or rather not following through what I believed, which is the fact that you cannot create and run a credible modern war machine if you do not have access to the sea or completely unfettered access over your land borders. And what had happened with Iraq, amongst other things, was people had confused smuggling with arms trading, arms movements on the grand scale. And I'll give you an instance. If you're a governor of a province next to Iraq and somebody offers you $100,000 to facilitate the transfer, the passing over the border of four Mercedes Benz 200 limousines, that's one thing. Facilitating the transfer of four T90 tanks, <laughs> that's a very different game. And of course, there I've been the previous year effectively managing the sanctions and also dealing with the oil and date smuggling and didn't actually think through the fact that, sorry guys, Iraq cannot possibly have a war machine that's going to stand up to it. And of course it didn't. And I regret, because I was on the uh, joint staff, not in the, um, I was in the long-term plans thing, but I do regret that I wasn't actually thinking this stuff through and saying, just be aware. Um, that perhaps what is being said couldn't necessarily be true. So. so, so your recent scholarship has been very focused on World War One. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about the the value of history or or a historical mindset to being an officer. But how do you take the events of a century ago, where there's no space, there's no cyber? There's none of the modern technology that we know today. And how do you take lessons from or ideas from that centuries old history and actually make it relevant? Because the way you do that is you actually try to understand the problems they're trying to solve. Um, in that period, naval tactics, the tactical level of Navy moves for the first time from being visual, totally, to potentially remote. And that causes, you know, that actually has profound effects because it actually causes the perception, the battle management perception to shift from being one of a panorama to a plan. Um, to give you a practical example, if you're the Admiral, either you can see the enemy or the ship you can see can see the enemy. If, the enemy, if your scout is making contact report, in that situation as the Admiral, you really only need two pieces of information. What does the enemy bear? And what is the enemy, what course is the enemy steering? Because everything else you can average out. Basically, what you want to know is the enemy's over there, they're steering that way, I go that way. That's all. Once you get to radio, you need to be very much more precise because you're moving to a plan. And in particular in the North Sea, uh, you really need to be precise because the visibility is generally rubbish. Three to five nautical miles average, generally worse. Um, and by the way, ships didn't know where they were within five nautical miles after eight hours. But in terms of perception, to give you an instance, the first time the British issue a formatted radio uh, enemy contact report, it does not actually include position. It composition of the enemy, what are they steering, all this sort of stuff, no position. I mean, it dawned on them, you know, actually that's, what, that's the real bit they needed. But what I'm getting is they're really trying to solve problems which are the perennial problems of naval warfare. Find, fix, strike. How do you find the enemy? How are you sure of the enemy's position so that you can achieve an intercept? And then, and this is where you get all the gunnery fire control problems and so on, you know, the, 
uh, the introduction of high order uh, mechanical um, analog computers, uh, well, electromechanical, and so on and so on, in order to achieve a firing solution at long range from a moving platform at a moving target. Now, I would in fact say there are extraordinary parallels, both uh, in sort of principle terms, but also in psychological terms. One of my real worries about the mentality of the current people at sea is because of the extent to which in the last 25 years they've been able to operate in an electronically uncontested environment with incredible bandwidth and incredible tools for exchanging information. We talk about the thousand mile screwdriver and that's true. The senior people at fault. But what I really worry about and there are parallels with the First World War because radio had the same effect, is the junior people at sea would rather ask permission than seek forgiveness. So when you get to a really seriously electronically contested environment, when there is no exchange of information, when you're uncertain and all the rest of it, how are you going to react and respond? 1914, 15, it was quite apparent that the invention of radio but without working through all the understanding of how this all worked, created what I call a virtual unreality. Um, basically, navies are bipolar. Uh, and the 19th century was almost the most extreme example. Um, if you could see the Admiral and the Admiral could see you, you did what the Admiral told you. By the way, I've been an Admiral. It's still true. Um, but if you were out of sight, you got on with it. As the British Prime Minister said, you know, if he had a problem overseas, he'd send a Royal Navy captain. He knew they'd be able to deal with it all themselves. And by the way, it's quite striking in World War I when you go and look at the early careers of the admirals who were all commanding. Even the admirals who did really badly, they did some amazing things around the world as junior officers, all on their own initiative. But the point is, they couldn't be in contact with the boss. So they reacted, and so they behaved accordingly. Radio created this idea that because you had radio contact, somehow the boss knew what was going on and you had to wait for the boss to tell you what to do. And there were some key actions where people clearly didn't think through the fact that the boss couldn't possibly know what's going on. Um, so that's, you know, that's an area where I do see parallels so psychologically. And, and I know in the last few years, you know, our Navy's been doing as much as they can to, you know, deal with this problem. In my view, it's not been sufficient. Um, and I have made a policy of insulting junior officers as a group whenever I see them to get them to um, actually think this one through. Because, as I say, I've seen the enemy and here's you. Um, it's not just the people at the top with a thousand mile screwdriver. By the way, and I've done it myself, switching off the thousand mile screwdriver is great. Oh, I've lost comms. <laughs> Goodness me. Nelson with his blind eye. Absolutely. No, I've done it on more than one occasion. <laughs> you know, um, basically because the boss couldn't help. So I think a parallel question, kind of coming from your own scholarship, particularly mm. you know, if we look at before Jutland and after Jutland, yep. th these, are, these books are very much wartime yep. books, right? Mm -hmm. um, but you know, when I look at your biography, I look at the commands you had. You, you commanded the Border Patrol Force. Border Protection Force, Border yeah. Border Protection Force. And, and you, as you were just mentioning before, yep. in the Persian Gulf, you were responsible for the maritime security operations yep. there. How do you see maritime security or the peacetime roles of a Navy fitting into concepts of modern sea power? Or is this just something that navies can naturally do as long as they're ready for war? OK. Um, I have a construct. The trouble is the United States is sui generis and it's not aware of just how unique it is. I have a construct I call the American Navy, and it's the US Navy and the US Coast Guard, because together you're a Navy. <laughs> Each of you is incomplete in a naval sense. Now I say that as a Navy which has to span the full spectrum. Um, and I do warn people against, you know, in fact, listening to Americans on the subject of maritime security because it's so sui generis. I'm not criticizing it, it's a different system. 
for a Navy like mine, I've done, well, in fact, not, not just with my own Navy, I've done fish, fishery protection in three parts of the world, and I hate fishermen. Um, a Navy like mine has to do maritime security. We have some civil side of things, which is not a Coast Guard, but you know, it has assets. And it's great to have the civil side, and I'm, you know, I was always very happy to have it. Um, but we don't have posse comitatus. You know, naval people, uh, we have the Australian Maritime Powers Act, which means Defence Force people, Australian Federal Police and Australian Border Force, which are our, you know, which have our civil marine stuff in it, can all enforce law. I don't like using naval people to enforce domestic law, but I can have and have done it myself. The point is that you've got to span the spectrum. You have to be a tool of government and you have to meet government needs and priorities. As you do so, you do need to be very clear with your government that if they're over tasking us in one area, stuff is going to drop off in the other area. And there is an inevitable tension between the high intensity stuff and maritime security. And indeed, I have a view that we got too tied up with maritime security, both in the Middle East and in our northwestern approaches, um, at the expense of our high level capabilities, which we're trying to recover um, as, as I speak, you know, in, in a parallel to the efforts of the US Navy. But the point is, and, and this is, you know, if you're examining the problem from an American point of view, that's why I think the construct of the American Navy is actually useful because you need to think about it as what does the nation need to do to cover the spectrum using its naval forces. Um, and as I say, it's an, it's an inevitable tension. So I've, you know, in my career, I've run the span from, you know, serious Cold War stuff, you know, having um, playing chicken with the Russians, the Soviets in the Baltic, um, to doing that sort of thing in several parts of the world. And I'll give you an instance about doing fishery protection um, in one part of the world that's been unexpected. In 1986, on exchange of the Royal Navy, I was on patrol in the Falklands a few, couple of years after the war. The amount of time we had to spend keeping Polish <laughs> trawlers and uh, Taiwanese squid jiggers apart, and we were desperately trying to get the British government to promulgate a um, fishing zone around the Falklands uh, in order that we would have some kind of legal authority to get people to behave uh, and also stop the grounds being stripped. Um, and the interesting thing is that the British shortly thereafter, having as I understand consulted with the Argentine government <laughs> in one of these informal exchanges you know, where there's nothing written down, to tell them why they were doing it, which was not to stick it up the Argentinians' nose, it was actually to protect the resources, which the Argentinians thought, well, yes, that's a, that's a good idea because there are resources anyway. Um, <laughs> but that they promulgated the, the area. Um, and, 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 I, and I always joke that Nelson died at Trafalgar, owed 50 guineas by the Scottish government for fishery protection work from 20 years earlier, which he'd never been paid for. And he was still pissed off about it. <laughs> so the, the, in addition to your historical work, You've done a lot of kind of contemporary analysis. Mm -hmm. You know, one of your books is on Southeast Asian navies yep. in, in the modern world. Yep. Um, and, and you do a great deal of writing uh, from Australia looking at the Indo-Pacific world. And so how do these kind of disparate streams that we've been talking about, right, understanding the differences between wartime and peacetime, understanding sea power, understanding the importance of a broader knowledge of history, how does that all come to inform how you see the Indo-Pacific world right now from a sea power standpoint? Um, well, that's really interesting because um, uh, one of the books I'll recommend will be Jeff Till's book on sea power, A Guide to the 21st Century, uh, the fourth edition, he's, which is different from the first edition. And there's a reason for that, which is that um, Jeff is a wonderful guy, one of the smartest people I know, was very much in the post-Cold War thing, taken up with the whole European postmodern idea that you know, we'd entered a postmodern era and maritime security, in fact, was actually going to be the big thing, you know, not interstate, not nation state stuff. Well, I was in Australia and um, writing our first Australian maritime doctrine, I made damn sure we included that no, <laughs> uh, Asia is different. Asia is modern. 
and this was even before the serious, serious rise of China, it was quite apparent to me that nationalism, uh, that all sorts of things were at play, which even if you accepted that Europe had gone postmodern and other parts of the world had, um, the Indo-Pacific, Southeast Asia, East Asia, uh, the Indian Ocean had not. Um, this, I suppose, is where um, having a wider idea of history and wider reading of history and understanding as much as possible where people are coming from culturally as well. Um, now, navies are more like each other than they're like anything else in their own countries, um, which is a, a truism, you know, I think I have sufficient experience globally to say. Um, but nevertheless, they are tools of and instruments, you know, the instruments and products of their own country. And their drivers are different. Um, uh, <coughs> you know, the things that really wind them up um, are different. Uh, and they, uh, they may well not have the same global outlook of not only countries like the United States, but a country like Australia, which is actually the child of the two areas of globalization, has always been, um, and has been dependent upon the global system. Whereas other countries, while they may have very serious maritime interests, it's very much more a local lens um, even though, you know, trading and so on is starting to become apparent. But I would most strongly emphasize the role of nationalism, and that's not simply for the Chinese. Uh, indeed, I think the Chinese are playing with fire um, over some of the things they're doing. And I'll give you one key example. The Chinese have started a narrative that somehow they were not part of the third law of the sea convention, and that this is a Western construct. Well, one they were. During the main negotiations in the nine years before the convention, China was part of the UN and China had delegates. And if you go and read the transcripts, Chinese delegates were very active, supporting the third world. Now the third law of the sea convention has some really fundamental changes to how we view the law of the sea. In particular, changing the Groshen idea of the, you know, the sea being for everybody, it's the global commons and so on, with the introduction, not only the exclusive economic zone, but a thing called the archipelagic regime, which is a construct from Indonesia, which the Philippines and Fiji very quickly got on board, which basically was that if your country is an island nation which meets certain specifications, then you are an archipelago and the, archipelag and the archipelagic regime can apply whereby with certain um, exemptions for uh, traffic through the archipelago, basically it's territorial waters. Now the point is that this is an Indonesian construct. I knew the guy who actually led it. He later became their foreign minister, Mokhtar Kasuma at Maja. He thought this up as a young lawyer and over the next 25 years he got it past the UN convention and got it accepted and sealed into it. And it's a fundamental change. It's so important. And the, the Indonesians have a very strong concept of land and water. They have about 17 or 18,000 islands in the archipelago, which actually stretches across the continental United States, if you, look at, if you put it on top. Um, and they have about 4,000 inhabited islands. They're not quite sure of the number. Um, but the land and water concept is central. The Chinese have started to eat away and extend their nine dash, you know, the, the effort, the nine dash line effort into the top part of the uh, archipelagic regime, which encompasses the Natuna Islands, which are in the South China Sea. Now, until this time, until they started doing this, Indonesia said, we're not a, we're not a concerned power. Now they are. Now, the point is that you cannot strike more closely at an element of Indonesian identity and great national pride and undermine Indonesia's declared archipelagic regime. And that's what the Chinese are doing. And as I say, I mean, the one country China does not want to annoy in Asia is actually Indonesia. And Indonesia doesn't want to be annoyed, but is happening. So, but the point is, it's actually understanding, you know, the history of that sort of thing is incredibly important in understanding how the dynamics 
of disputes at sea are playing out. So before we turn it over to the audience, I, got, I have one last question. And uh, so if you were speaking with a, a junior officer or a brand new ensign today, what two or three uh, books mm -hmm. or maybe other media sources yep. would you recommend to that young officer? I'll be hopelessly old fashioned and stick to books. I've got three. Uh, one I've already mentioned, Jeff Till's Sea Power Guide for the 21st Century, and that is if you want to read about sea power, that's the one book. It covers everything. It's the 101 book. If you've read that and understood it, you've got it. My Je just as an aside, it is available as an ebook to all of you via Nimitz Library. You can download chapters this afternoon. The second is somewhat lighter in tone, um, but is actually a good book for a junior officer, Admiral Jim Stavridis' Sea Power book. Because um, he's written it from his own perspective of his naval career. And he's a, I'm not quite so sure about his novels, but um, it's, he's, a, he's a good writer. And it's a great read. The third might be a bit unexpected, but I urge you as American naval officers to read it, is a book published in English in 1976 written by a Soviet admiral, or at least by his staff, uh, Sergei Georgievich Gulshkov, who was Commander-in-Chief of the Soviet Navy from 1956 to 1988. And it's called The Sea Power of the State. Why I think you should read it is because this is a navalist argument in the widest sense, in other words, encompassing all aspects of potential maritime activity being put in a Marxist-Leninist state to a continental power whose strategic culture has hitherto been dominated by the army. And I know the Chinese are reading Mahan, although they're much more interested in France than Britain. But this book, in my view, is the real template for what they're doing. Because Goshkov is talking whole of nation he is talking maritime industry, he's talking fishing, he's talking scientific research, he's talking offshore uh, exploration, and he's talking merchant navy, and he's talking navy. And he, this is to convince the Politburo and frankly the Soviet army. And by the way, there's lots of wonderful stuff about defending the motherland, so the Soviet army didn't think he was too unsound. Um, but it's a template which, in my opinion, is probably the best guide available at the moment for actually what the Chinese are trying to do as China becomes for the first time a maritime dependent power. Now that which is the slight difference, Gorshkov is trying to make Russia, uh, the Soviet Union maritime power without it yet being maritime dependent. The Chinese are facing the, reali the reality they become maritime dependent, which is a first in Chinese history. Um, and how do you deal with that? And by the way, they do need to explain it. Um, admittedly, I was in Urumqi. I had met a Chinese two-star general who had never seen the sea. He'd never been further uh, east than Beijing. And the idea of an admiral was a bit much. All right, well, thank you. So what we'll do now is we'll open up to questions from the audience. Uh, we're recording for YouTube later. so. Uh, we don't have microphones to pass around, so I'll, I'll repeat the gist of the question so that the camera can get it. But please, uh, whoever would like to, to chime in. Uh, sir, first off, thank you for coming to speak with us. Um, my question is regarding your advice to look through a historical lens at current issues. Um, the question is, how can you look through this historical lens without sort of committing the error of incorrectly um, comparing it to too closely to past events. Like an example would be trying to compare Putin's invasion of Ukraine to Hitler's invasion or Hitler's kind of encroachment um, in the 1930s. So, so the, the question is, how do you use a historical lens without getting too close of an analogy that makes it invalid? Because in my view, the historical lens doesn't give you ans uh, answers, but it does lead you to start to identify the questions you should be asking of the contemporary problem. Uh, and for instance, um, where I might be more um, 
uh, saying there are analogies and you need to think about the effects, uh, are the sanctions on Japan in 1940 and 41, and the effect of those sanctions on a country whose government and military had abandoned any reality that we would recognise, in fact abandoned any reality that anybody else recognised, at least in the West. Um, and what were the effects and how did that drive the Japanese government? So that as we look at the sanctions that are being imposed on Russia, uh, a closed society led by somebody who does now seem to be in their own reality, um, you know, what are the things we need to think about about the potential second, first, second and third order consequences? Because you know, that rationality isn't necessarily the, you know, the, the governing feature for the behaviour. So it, it gets down to me, it's the questions. You're absolutely right. It's not the, oh yeah, this happened, therefore, you know, if we do that. But it would be to go, mm, okay, so what if, what if they, you know, decide this is a cause for further military action? Um, you know, that sort of thing. How do we, you know, what do we do? Sebastian. Uh, thank you for your talk. Um, can you talk a little bit about the prospects for international cooperation from an Australian point of view, naval point yep. of view, um, in particular with the nuclear submarine uh, trilateral deal, um, in particular with um, the, well, previous to 24th February, the idea that European navies would come out to the Pacific and play. Um, is that changing? What are we going to see here in that realm? Well, it's really two separate questions. Um, I suppose I have a concern about promises of, of promises of cooperation and presence which involve physical units when the forces promising to provide them are not of sufficient strength for the areas which are actually of their first concern. Um, I've got no problem about, you know, say, you know, Bayern coming out for a visit, that's great. And I also think we should be doing as much as we can for non-geographically related cooperation, you know, that where, it's, where geography is not involved. But when I look, for instance, well, at the size of the German Navy, there's no way you can dispatch forces which are going to be of any use in any kind of contingency. Um, similarly, I have real concerns over the Royal Navies. Um, I tell you, and I think I've been, I would say I've been confirmed by recent events, my view is that the French and the Brits should sort out the programs of the three carriers so there's always a, U a European carrier battle group operational. You know, and no, you don't go to the Indian Ocean or the Pacific um, because you just have not got the assets. Um, you know, and again, it's not so global Britain, I get it, um, soft power, trade, fantastic, and yes, political signals, by all means. Um, I, you know, I thought the Bayern deployment was quite well judged. Um, but the reality is you're just not strong enough as Europeans. And I would actually tell you, I have a very strong view that the pivot was actually the United States trying to tell Europe that the United States had to focus on the Indo-Pacific and China, and Europe needed to pull its finger out and take much more of the burden dealing with Russia. And that's an, Aust you know, an Australian view not publicly expressed, but I would suspect I'm uh, not alone in that. Um, and there is a, an element, I, I know why the Royal Navy got a bit overexcited getting a carrier back, but um, you know, they've only got, you know, what, um, uh, 19 combatants, service combatants. They only got 23,000 people in naval uniform. You know, when they say, oh, 30,000 people in the naval service, 7,000 are Marines. Marines don't man your engine rooms. <laughs> um, you know, they're just, they're just not big enough. And I think there should be more semi-formal division of geographic effort. As to the Indo-Pacific, NATO, uh, NATO, something like NATO will not happen. Um, I see us developing ever closer ties, particularly with Japan. Um, and I hope to continue with India. Um, 
and I would hope to continue, I mean, I would like us to be doing as much as we can with Indonesia. But these need to be arrangements. These need to be people accustomed to working together, agreed procedures, you know, the ability to actually bring people together when you've got something that really galvanises people together, rather than trying to impose some sort of formal alliance construct, which is very much, I mean, Vietnam, actually, it's in their constitution. I think that they simply cannot have an alliance with anybody, just they cannot have any foreign basing in, in Vietnam. Um, so how do we cooperate, how do we develop sufficient levels of cooperation with Vietnam that I, as a naval commander, would be quite happy to have a couple of Vietnamese ships join and we put a couple of liaison officers on board, but we'd know we were used to working well enough together that it would work. So what I'd say is lots of informal arrangements and working on the like-minded idea, but not trying to go for grand alliances, which of course plays straight into the Chinese book, uh, you know, paranoia anyway. All right, looks like we have time for one last question. Thank you, Thank you for speaking today. Could you talk a bit more about Australian intervention in uh, East Timor, and I guess how that changed uh, Australia's perception in the Indo-Pacific and on the world stage as well? The question was about the Australian intervention in East Timor and how it affected Australia's view of the Pacific. Um, it's an interesting, I was actually in Jakarta when the plebiscite result got announced at the Naval Staff College. Not a happy day. Um, Did it change? I suppose it changed Australians' outlook to the realisation that uh, what for a while was called the arc of instability was a real problem. I'm not really sure it changed the Australian military's outlook. It did change the governments to the extent that they were more willing to resource things and move away from the defence of Australia context, the sort of space invaders idea that we'd have strike and fighter aircraft in northern bases and the enemy would somehow come down. I mean, it's still, it's still at play in certain elements of the strategic um, um, dialogue in Australia. But I think uh, government realised that they needed to resource the defence forces more and that they needed to acknowledge uh, that it was not just about the physical offence of Australia. It was about, and the Navy could have told them this at any time, you know, in the previous 25 years, it was about protection of the system and stability and doing what we could to keep things stable. Um, hence interventions in the Solomons and, and so on. And hence the fact that, you know, we've just had uh, uh, both our big amphibious ships in Tonga um, as part of the uh, disaster relief eff effort. Um, so I suppose it was the, uh, the, the change was the realisation that the world was a lot more unstable, closer to us than people had thought, and that government needed to put more resources. Now we're coming, you know, the, the realisation is dawning that even more resources are needed as the strategic uh, environment has continued to deteriorate. Um, it's helped by the fact the Chinese keep, keep behaving badly. Um, I can't believe how ham-fisted they've been. Um, you know, they were illuminating one of our P8s with a laser um, north of Australia only a couple of weeks ago. And the P3 was, you know, never got within four kilometres. But just to give you an instance, they sent a photograph. They published a photograph saying, "Oh yes, we're being harassed by this Australian aircraft." And one commentator said, "Well, when I first saw the photograph, I thought the Australian P8s had a cloaking device." And then he realised it was this little dot, <laughs> several kilometres away. Um, so you know, there is a realisation, and China was very ham-fisted in the tra using trade you know, trying to jam Australian exports, um, which didn't, didn't actually work out very well for China. Worked out much better for us than we expected. Um, and they still have to take our iron ore. Okay, well thank you so much. Pleasure. Thank you everybody for coming. We're about out of time because the midshipmen have to get to class. Um, Keep in, keep in touch, keep in tune in email. We'll be announcing our last two First Bell lectures of the semester in the coming weeks. Uh, and we'll start planning for our fall semester events as well. I want to thank Admiral Goldrick for his time Thanks, today. And thank you all for coming. Thanks for coming.